sleep overnight on top of Kadaridris. And in the morning, legend tells us, you'll be either a corpse, a madman, or a poet. But perhaps the mountains bless all who just see them with the gifts of madness or magic. Because from the Stone Age to the New Age, the rugged beauty of Wales has inspired numerous painters and musicians, poets and dreamers. At weekends, local farmer Arvon Evans leaves his life on the land and heads for the sky. In the 1950s, Arvon flew meteor jet fighters with the RAF. These days, he's a member of the Mona Flying Club on Anglesey, and his aircraft is a small two-seater Cessna. But it still needs checking for safety. For over 10 years, Arvon's been accompanied on his flights of fancy by amateur photographer Gwilym Davis. Gwilym juggles up to four Mamiya cameras using fast color film, which he develops himself at home. Once in the air, they're coasting the currents and circling whales at heights up to 5,000 feet and reaching speeds of around 100 miles per hour. Even so, Gwilym pokes his head out of the open window, aiming for his best shots of the countryside below. Climbing above the mountains and the clouds, he's built up an intriguing portfolio of photographs with an extraterrestrial quality. Meanwhile, down on the ground, Valley Stream's camera crew have scoured the land over several years to find the best eye-level video footage. Blended together with Gwilym's eagle-eyed views, their camera work provides a fascinating guide to the spirit and attraction of North Wales. On the extreme tip of Holy Island, west of Anglesey, the isolated rocks of North and South Stack reach out into a blue Irish sea. All these cliffs are the haunts of seabirds. Hundreds of razorbill, guillemot and puffin nest here. The Victorians encouraged them since their cries gave sailors warning of land during foggy weather. Indeed, one of the caves is so noisy with squawking that it's known, fittingly, as Parliament House. The first lighthouse men reached South Stack over the crashing waves in a basket slung on a rope. Nowadays, a chain suspension bridge will take you across. If you climb down, and up, the 400 steps that is. Holy Island has always been important because of its nearness to Ireland. The Romans built a fort here in the third century to defend their British colony from pirates. After 300 years, St. Cubby reused the Roman walls to surround his new church. The many inns in the fishing village of Hollyhead, which grew up around Cubby's church, were crowded with impatient passengers waiting to set sail. After the completion in Victorian times of Telford's Road, 270 miles from London, and Stevenson's Railway, Hollyhead became the chief port for Dublin. For over 500 years, since 1575, the mail to Ireland has always got through. Only once, when the Menai Strait railway bridge burnt down, was the post delayed. Near Holyhead station, an obelisk honours one marine postman who campaigned for improvements to the harbour. Alas, poor Captain Skinner fell overboard and was drowned near North Stack, despite his mailboat being called the Escape. The inner harbour of Hollyhead is protected by a one and a half mile breakwater from rough Irish seas. In calm weather, the Victorian steam packets took five to seven hours to make the crossing. Today, the Stena Line ferries take just 99 minutes and offer round trips at sunset. 
Treadil Bay nearby is now a popular water sport center for yachtsmen and jet skiers. But 5,000 years ago, the new Stone Age men who lived here were more interested in life's essentials, harpooning fish from dugout canoes. These people lived in timber huts long since rotted away, but the stone tombs in which they buried their dead still survive. Both Holy Island and Anglesey are scattered throughout with the signs of our earliest ancestors. Around the time of Christ, the Druids retreated to Holy Island from a Roman invasion of Britain. Today, an embankment bridges the two islands, carrying Telford's Highway and Stevenson's Railway via the Roman Road, renamed the A5, to the city of Londinium beyond. Near Molvre on Anglesey, the limestone villa of a native chieftain, alive in Roman Britain, can clearly be seen. This was a wealthy agricultural estate. The family left behind coins and silver, glass vessels and imported pottery, neatly repaired. By this time, Emperor Constantine had introduced Christianity to the British Isles. Our earliest churches were founded in the 5th century. Churchyards were circular, and the church was aligned with the shadow of a cross held up at sunrise. St. Cyril settled at Penmon. He and St. Cubby of Holyhead were good friends and met each other every day. St. Cubby always walked 15 miles eastward into the sun, and thus being tanned, he earned the name Cubby the Dark. St. Cyril walked 15 miles westward, away from the sun, and he was called Cyril the Fair. The peaceful saints were followed in the 13th century by Edward I, warmonger of England. He created four new boroughs in North Wales, each one protected by an encircling town wall and a grand castle. Beaumaris Castle was the last of these, and it was the masterpiece of his favourite French architect, James of Savoy. This is the ultimate in designer castles. Beaumaris Castle was never completed, although over 2,000 labourers were employed here, and none of them were Welshmen. The Welsh population had already been removed to Newborough. Only decades later, a terrific storm buried their cornfields in sand. This was the beginning of Newborough Warren dunes, which provided rabbits for the pot and marram grass for baskets and fishing nets. At one end of the beach, St. Dwynwyn settled on the rocky spit reaching into Carnarvon Bay. Her secluded church became a pilgrimage site for lovers. Ghost ships and grey seals patrol the northern coast of Anglesey at Trith Dillas. Riverborne sand has formed shifting banks here, which almost block the estuary. On an island nearby, a Victorian lady stored provisions for shipwrecked mariners. Optimistically, therefore, during World War II, a grand flotilla congregated offshore, preparing for D-Day. <laughs> 